Good evening, good afternoon, and good night. My name is Thomas T. Burkinier, and you are watching a Mission Control Email Camp On Demand panel. Let me, ladies and gentlemen, let me take that off for a moment. But the truth is out there. We are talking about debunking email deliverability myths, and I've got amazing email thought leaders here in outer space today. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a good time, most importantly. So we are talking about the truth is out there, debunking email deliverability myths. And like I said, we've got some amazing presenters, and I can't wait for me to introduce them. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's start this off. First and foremost, we've got Alex Brotman coming to us from Comcast, the senior engineer of anti-abuse. Alex, how are you doing today, man? Good to see you as always. Wonderful. Thanks for having us. Of course, of course. And moving on. First time here at Email Camp Mission Control. Also a, a guest of our podcast, Email's Not Dead, Brad Gurley, Director of Deliverability at Message Gears. Brad, how are you doing today, bud? Uh, doing fantastic. Great hanging out with you. Awesome, awesome. Good to have you here, man. Good to have you here. And moving along, uh, first time, and also our good friends over at Blue Shift, Mr. Pankaj Kumar, Senior Deliverability Analyst at Blue Shift. Pankaj, how are you doing today, man? Yeah, doing fantastic. Yeah, excited. Thanks for being here. Excited you get to join us. And moving down the line, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Mr. Tom Corbett, the email deliverability consultant at Iterable. Tom, how are you doing today? Doing well, and appreciate you having me here today. Of course, of course. So grateful you got to be here with us today. And last but not least, you've seen her on a lot of our deliverability webinars. You've seen her on email camp before. She talks a lot about our deliverability stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Naruzzi, our VP of deliverability, CPAS at Cinch. Kate, how are you doing today? Very good. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for being here, ladies and gentlemen. All right, y'all. Let's have some fun, shall we? Um, cool. So moving on here, we're talking about truths. Or myths. And oh, wow. Looks like uh, yesterday, it looks like some alien news might have gotten announced. But we're going to be talking about truths or myths today. So these are all common topics. Each slide includes a common and frequently discussed deliverability topics. We've kind of scanned the world and try to see uh, which ones are most common. So we were super excited about bringing these to you. Uh, up next. So are we talking about truths or myths? So we're asking our experts to share their wisdom. You know, are these true or are they a common misconception or is the truth out there? Right. Um, and so we're going to debunk these myths and share insights on how these really impact, you know, everyone's deliverability strategy. So let's get started, shall we? OK, truth or myth. Here we go. Here we go. Our first one coming up. And I want to hear from all of our panelists on this one. A new IP can be blocked during a migration. Panelists, how are we feeling about this? There's a little bit of nuance to this. It's not quite as simple as that. It's not necessarily true, not necessarily false, but it's not going to happen just because it's a migration. Um, it, you know, there's probably more to it than you can see. So, all I, right. Who else? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump right in. I, you know, I think whenever you're doing a migration, uh, there's always going to be some adjustment period for the mailbox providers to figure out your mail stream, kind of who you are, where you're sending from, if you're sending from a new infrastructure. Uh, so there may be some delays, some, you know, things going to the spam folder, depending on the provider. But uh, yeah, I mean, it absolutely can be blocked, but I think more likely you're expecting that kind of nuance that Alec talked about. Tom, Kate, Pinkaj, how are we feeling? I want to mm -hmm. chime in here. If you have established reputations for your domain or your subdomain when you are moving to new ip space that whole migration period can be expedited based on the reputation of your existing domain and subdomain so yes there's always a chance a new ip can get blocked because there is no history attached to it but i wouldn't worry too much if you have a great reputations on your organizational or subdomains yeah i agree with i agree with Kate, what she said, yeah, domain reputation also carries some kind of weight. So um, if you are, um, uh, as per me, if you um, uh, think as a student that if you are doing good at one school, switching into the another, another school, you will be doing the good there also. Um, this indicates that if you are having a very good solid sending practices uh, um, from your previous IP addresses, there is a high chance that uh, you will not get blocked again if you maintain the same consistency of the email, same consistency of the strategy that you are making. But still, 
if you deviate from the path, there is certain chance that you you might get blocked. Gotcha, Tom. Anything on that? Yeah, and no, I want to agree. Yeah, with the rest of the panel here, I think you know the key bit is is planning and transparency. So when working with you know an ESP or even you know notifying mailbox providers like, hey, we are making a change, and just being as you know upfront as possible, you know. They can happen, but you know, if as much as you plan out, you can avoid as you know, m mitigate that risk as much as possible. All right, all right. There you have it. All right, moving on. When your IPs are blocked by ISPs, you should spin up new IPs and domains to avoid time-consuming IP domain reputation and repair. Panelist, how are we feeling? I mean, I could start. Um, I, I would say avoid it. We don't want to. We don't want to be in that situation of just spinning up things. I think it's very similar to behavior of illegitimate senders. Um, you know, they will blast out as much emails as possible. Once that gets blocked, what do they do? They spin up a brand new IP, brand new domain, and just continue going. So, um, chart the course. You know, mistakes do happen. You know, and you know, you know page, patience is a virtue. But you know, you will get the results if you um, work hard at it. I like that. Chart the course. Kate, how are you feeling about this? I would highly discourage um, reputable senders uh, to jump into a new IP space or a new subdomain because that is a behavior of a spammer. Spammers do not have time to repair anything. So as soon as they are blocked, they go to a new IP block, new subdomain. So mistakes happen as Tom mentioned, but when they do happen, take time to address those. Be very, very um, clear and upfront with the ISPs and mailbox providers about what has happened, what steps you have taken to fix the issue and to avoid it to happen in future. So definitely a myth and um, patience is the key in repairing uh, IP domain reputation. Love it, love it. So I want to ask Brad and Pankaj next, and then we'll have Alex go since he's an ISP. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pankaj. No, 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 you can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. No, I think uh, you know Tom and uh, and Kate made very good points about you know looking like a spammer, and that's the key thing here is that you are. You know, these are practices that are very common among people that are, you know, sending malicious mail or going out and scraping addresses or, you know, kind of doing all of these things that we know are, are bad practices. Um, and when you are sending to the ISPs using those same practices, uh, you're going to get lumped in with those groups. So even if you are a legitimate sender, if you are doing things right for the most part, um, spinning up new IPs, new domains makes you look less trustworthy in the eyes of the providers. So, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely got to put myth on this one. Yeah, spinning up the new IPs uh, should not even be an option for an ideal sender. So that's a indicator of the spammer, as the pan other panelists said. Yeah, so um, it's uh, uh, the marketer should focus on repairing the reputation uh, with their existing setup rather than going into the, going with the new IP options. So th this is definitely a myth. All right. Now, last but not least, hearing from the ISP, Alex, what do you think? So not only is this, this is a myth, obviously, but not just that. This is potentially extremely damaging. I mean, you, that's it, to what reinforce what everybody said, it, you're taking actions that make you look like a malicious sender. Um, you know, take time to analyze and, you know, how did you arrive at that point? And then make a plan to come out of that, you know, that state. And, you know, and if you need help, I mean, there's, there's ways to ask, but I mean, trying to spin up new IPs and domains is just definitely the wrong way to go. If you're a legitimate sender, you want to be a spammer, I can't help you, but you know, <laughs> do the right thing. You're going to have a bad time. <laughs> yeah. All right, moving on here. Okay. Opens are a liable metric. All right, let's start with Brad on this one. Oh, that's good. I was I was chomping at the bit for this. So, <laughs> um, you know, over the the past couple of years, we've heard a lot of uh, malignment of open rates, uh, even more so than usual. Um, you know, open typically tracked through a pixel. Uh, you know, did you load this image? And there are a lot of different ways that that image can get loaded. If it's through prefetching, as we've seen with you know Apple's mail privacy protection, Google and Yahoo are both doing the same thing. Uh, you know, we know a lot of providers are doing similar things. So. 
opens are not necessarily a reliable metric on the user level. So you can't say, okay, this person opened this message. They didn't open this message where they can be a little more reliable is in looking at trends. So if you see, you know, a large increase in open rate or a large decrease in open rate, that can be somewhat reliable to tell you that something changed, but I think not necessarily on the individual level. Gotcha. And since we put him at the back last time, let's ask, let's ask uh, Mr. Alex, Alex, what are you thinking on this one? I don't want to say that opens are like, I think sort of what Brad was saying, like they're, it, they're, it's getting harder to harder to trust them. I, and unfortunately I don't want to say that opens as a metric are dead. Um, but I think it's just getting, it's, if you can't reliably find a way to eliminate what are, you know, those non-human interactions, whatever it may be, then you are going to have a tough time believing any of your, those metrics and saying like, Oh, well, we had, you know, 50% open. Okay, that's great, but it, is it true? And if it's not, then I don't know that, you know, because because then it may look bad that your click rate is so much lower or your conversion rate is lower. You know, so I don't know what that means necessarily in terms of marketing, but it doesn't sound good to me that you, you know, because somebody opened it, you think opened it, and then you suddenly lost, you know, 97% of your audience after that. Like, that sounds weird and bad. So I don't know. Um, I think it's I think it's a tough thing to say, and I don't think that they're necessarily reliable. But I, you know, I assume that they're they're still out there for a reason. So, gotcha. I Kate? don't think they were ever a, a reliable metric to begin with. Even ten years ago, even before Apple privacy uh, was pushed, um, open rates should be one of the five other things that you look at in order to uh, measure success for a campaign. And as mentioned previously, um, you need to keep looking at the trend. Like if your opens with Comcast is always at 40% and at Yahoo is at 25% and suddenly Yahoo goes down to 10, yes, something is off. You need to address that. But only because your opens are 40% at Comcast, it doesn't mean they will be 40% at Gmail. So if your Gmails are at 25%, don't panic and think something is going off, it is always good to look at the past 90 days and see if there is any sudden uh, decrease or increase. Those are, just, those are the times that I always tell senders to worry and try start looking into things. But if, it, if at one ISP you have a certain open rate and the other one it is lower or higher, I would not take that as a reliable metric. Gotcha. All right, let's go with yeah, Tom. I want to echo, um, yeah, I want to echo like uh, case comments around, you know, not being reliable, you know, for over 10 years. I think, I, I think many of us forget, you know, when Gmail's market share kind of started to increase, open rates sucked at Gmail. Um, and then suddenly the proxy happened and everyone's like happy that they're getting 30% open rates. Um, but, you know, I, I see it, it's, it's, it's a good indicator of like how active, like, the recipient devices right we know that the you know, gmail is proxying it's a case of someone potentially logging in same with apple okay it's going to an iphone we know it's it's there which maybe they're not it's not relevant to that individual so it's maybe a soft indicator of placement you know we know if your open rates suddenly tank to zero uh you know at gmail or wherever you got okay maybe uh, Apple or that device is suddenly going to spam. So it's kind of useful indicator, but I wouldn't use it as a reliable to say this person wants or is reading my email. Gotcha. Closing comments yeah. from Pakaj. Uh, uh, I agree. I agree with all the panelists. They said, yeah, opens are reliable only when you see them as a trend. Otherwise, it is not um, a good idea to measure a success of campaign based on the certain number of opens received against that campaign. So that is not a good idea. So that's it. Awesome. All right. Moving on to the next one. Okay. A dedicated IP is always the best option to mitigate risk and improve deliverability. All right, Pinkaj, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, yeah, most of the time, I think uh, uh, we recommend um, that dedicated IP is the good thing um, to have any sender on it. Um, because if if any sender uses um, shared IP pool, and that means that they are either trying to uh, carry some um, carry carry reputation from the other sender. So that is not a good thing. Because even even a good sender, if they are using a shared IP, 
their reputation may get hampered by other brands so it is always advisable and recommended approach that every brand uh, and not even uh, not only the brand even even in one brand if you have multiple uh, vertical or multiple uh, streaming of email you should have a dedicated ip for each so that's uh, what my approach is so i think this is a uh, truth gotcha all right kate i for this 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 is slightly a co complicated one it can be uh, true or false i can go with both if your volumes are extremely low and by low i mean if you are sending let's say 2000 emails a month there is it will take forever to build reputation on a dedicated ip so and a lot of like mailbox providers have moved on to uh, looking at the domain reputation, given we have exhausted the IPv4 space, a lot of um, focus has shifted from IP reputation, which was the main thing la like about 10 years ago towards the domain reputation. So I highly recommend segment your traffic on different subdomains. But whether or not you are using a dedicated IP, if, if the volumes are low, it is going to hurt you. That's, that's my comment on this one. Gotcha, gotcha. And then let's hear from Brad. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I always like to make the joke. And if you've heard me speak on IPs, you've probably heard me say this before that you ask 10 different deliverability experts, how much volume should you have on dedicated IP, you're going to get 11 different answers. <laughs> um, because everybody has their own sort of methodology for what is that cutoff that Kate mentioned of like, okay, you know, what's low enough volume that you can't really establish a reputation versus, you know, where you're where are you at the high end where you need to start adding IPs. I think for me, the really the, the best thing to keep in mind is that most of the major providers are doing domain reputation now as well. So they're not looking just at IP or even just at domain. They're looking at a combination of the two. So it's OK. You are the person who's sending from this set of IPs, but you're also sending from this particular you know authentication domain. So they're able to match that up. So even if you're on a shared pool of IPs, you're still going to have some level of isolation from the other senders on there. So I think in that case, there are situations where, you know, whether it be low volume or uh, just, uh, you know, a, a configuration, if it's an administrator challenge, uh, there are situations where a shared IP can work, you know, perfectly fine for a brand uh, and still maintain that deliverability. All right. And let's hear from an ISP side. Alex. I actually think there was a lot of good summary here. I mean, this is, it is a myth. Um, but there's a little bit of nuance behind it. You know, Kate's points about your volume are pretty spot on, right? Like, you you know, the, one of the fears is always that your shared IP means you're sharing with with bad people. That's not always the case. It could be good people who just have low volume. And so sometimes it may actually um, be more beneficial for you to be on that shared IP. Uh, and so there's there's there is a little bit of nuance. And I think everybody has sort of alluded to that. Um, and, and it seems like that's, you know, that's sort of the right answer. I mean, there is your person who is your deliverability expert who's helping you you know find the best uh um plan will will be able to answer these questions for you so if it, whether it be kate or someone you know someone else or or any of these other people here on this panel um you know they are the people who probably can best tell you if what you're doing would be better served by a dedicated ip so. and closing comments from tom yeah i kind of want to echo and agree with what has been said before but like i think it said it is you know, part of it is volume and as alex mentioned about the shared network some of those shared networks are really good you know those customers don't have the volumes but um you know we have a responsibility as deliverability consultants specialists to work with customers help identify like hey you've had rapid growth now would perhaps be a good time to look at migration let's plan ahead rather than be exponential and then it's a lot more work to migrate onto a dedicated ip same with you know businesses change they they kind of reduce volume. You know, there's, we've seen in kind of economic climates change. Some businesses have gone fully online and changed. So I think it's about us working with customers well to identify what is the the best configuration for them. Exactly. And these, ladies and gentlemen, are the best deliverability experts, and that's why they are here. All right, moving on to the next one. Okay. If your emails are going to the promotions tab, oh, you can contact Google to get them moved to the primary inbox. Oh, can you, does Google have a red phone that we can contact them at? 
Uh, we're going to go with, let's hear from an ISB first on this one. Alex. Um, so, A, first of all, you will hear almost everybody tell you the promotions tab is the inbox. So have no fear there. Um, but also, there is really, uh, there's a lot of, I hate to say machine learning, but there's a lot of algorithm that goes on behind the scenes to determine what goes where. Um, so can you contact them? Can anybody contact them? Maybe, I don't know, but honestly, uh, if you think it's wrong, it's probably better to try to figure out why it's wrong instead of just reaching out to Google and say, fix it. So there's probably something going on in your message that, uh, you know, but ultimately the, the, the promotions tab is probably the right place, but if it's an update that goes into promotions, that's a different problem. So that, you know, that's something that you can look at and say, oh, did we put some marketing material into our promotions or into our update message and therefore, that's why that mixed message ends up in the promotion. Maybe that's why. Maybe you're not getting the placement you want, but it doesn't mean that you should be in the primary inbox. So. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, okay, let's hear from Tom on this one. <laughs> I think we all, you know, everyone wishes that there was a, a, a magic back phone, right? Um, but, you know, I think there's a, there's more benefits to the promotion stuff. Like we know it's the inbox. Um, you know, Gina has been pushing all this annotation markup. So you actually can do more in the promotions tab, right? You could have nice visuals, carousels, you know, that's more interaction. You know, we have very short attention spans this day, so standing out from the crowd is good. Um, I will say I did have a funny call this week with a customer who is doing the promotion, you know, the carousel images. A lot of their image emails were actually going to the primary tab and they went, can you call Google to move it into the promo tab? And I was like, you are the first customer I've ever spoken to to ask that question. <laughs> Oh man, love it when it happens. Love it when it happens. Pinkaj, <laughs> you want to comment on this one? Yeah, why not? Uh, uh, promotional emails are going into promotional tab. That's the right place, and I, I agree with that. And uh, the other uh, dimension of is this: that if a user is um, checking their promotional tabs, that means they have a very good buying intention. So the conversion will be better there if your email is landing into the promotional tab otherwise if your promotional email getting into your uh, primary or update that means the user is not having any kind of buying intention and they will simply complain about you I mean, they, they can simply uh, mark as a spam or answer so that's it yeah so we should it is not a you know um, good idea to contact google for this because google has made this for the user experience so they are not going to do anything and kate how do you feel about this one um, I definitely I'm gonna go with myth with this one because promotional tab is not the spam folder. As the other panelists mentioned, promotional tab is the inbox. It's just where the marketing emails belong. So, and I probably hear this at least two or three times a month when we are either onboarding customers or we have existing customers that they say, hey, we are doing this seed testing and we are seeing this results with these new IPs because we are going to the primary. And I'm like, no, you do not want to be in primary if you are sending marketing traffic because it's going to actually really um, make the subscribers angry if the messages somehow are, because the inbox is a play. If your subscribers love your messages and they want to separate them from the promotion, they can always move them to primary and Google will respect that. But trying to game the system, especially Google with all of these machine learnings going on, that would definitely backfire. So spam folder is different than promotion tab. Promotion tab is the inbox. It is not primary because it doesn't need to go to primary if it is marketing. Exactly. Any closing comments left, left on that one? Anyone else? Um, I, I'll add just one thing. Uh, you know, I do think, as everyone said, it is pretty much a myth. But I think, you know, contacting Google to Alex's point, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can't. You know, who knows? You shouldn't really rely on, okay, I'm going to reach out to whatever provider and say, you know, let's fix my my issue of going to the you know, promotions folder or spam folder. But um, also, you know, there are probably some, you know, vendors out there, agencies, ESPs, whomever that say, hey, we've got the, you know, the the magic to the primary folder, um, you know, and to, to kind of piggyback on Kate a little bit there. Um, yeah, it, it might work. It may work for a little bit. Um, it's not going to work for long. So <laughs> just keep that in mind. 
Exactly. All right. All right. Let's see. Up next. Up next. <laughs> this one. I want to hear all of you at the same time for this one. The Gmail promotions tab is the inbox. Truth or myth? True. Truth. Truth. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That one, I don't think we need to sit on that one for much longer. <laughs> if anyone has any statements on that one, feel free. Go ahead. All right, perfect. Moving on. Okay, you can use tools to warm up your IP. Ooh, okay. All at the same time, one more time. What do we think on this one at the same time, everybody? Myth. 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 I, Brad, yeah, I, go I ahead. To, yeah, I have to disagree a little bit. So I think it depends on what you mean by tools. Uh, if you're looking at you know, a lot of providers, ESPs have sort of an automated warm up tool so you can gradually move your traffic on, kind of warm up things the right way, but you're not having to manually choose the jobs and that sort of thing. So, yes, that could be considered a tool to warm up your IP. If you're talking about, you know, some third party that's, hey, use these email addresses and we'll open and click on all your emails, then no, you can't. So, there's a little bit of, of nuance there. You should not, could not, or you can, I guess, but you should yeah. not try to cheat the warm up process. Yeah. Which is what I think what this was trying to say. So, yeah. Who else feels strongly about this one? Uh, it it may mean that if your ESP is uh, providing this as a feature, you can opt opt for it. Otherwise, it is not a good suggestion to opt for a third party warm up tool. Tom. Yeah, I agree with Brad and. Uh, on this one is that yeah it, it's nuanced like don't not third party but work with your esp on the right way you know sending wanted mail to customers to warm your IP. love it and kate close us out on that one no to third party warm-up tools yes to if your esp is providing an automated warm-up oh all right and then moving on to the next one this kind of kind of coincides the next one here we go you can use shared pools to warm up your new IP. Oh, hold on. Kate's, Kate's shaking her head. Kate, go go first on that one. Yeah. So I probably this is, I see, I hear this at least once or twice every week from the new prospects or even existing customers when they want to kind of bring up new traffic or new cust onboard a new customer. They say, can we use your shared pools in order to warm up our IPs? And then I'm like, okay. What, what what is going to happen next? You are going to take those shared IPs with you and make it your dedicated IPs or you are just going to leave them and start on a new IP. So you need to go through the ramp up again. What is the point of just confusing ISPs with all of these movements? So try to minimize your movements in the IP space. Start from if you belong to shared pools, if your volumes are low and your uh, deliverability experts or analysts or advisor, has, they have told you, use shared IPs, use shared IPs. But if you are going to be on dedicated IPs, do not use ESP's shared pools in order to ramp up your IP. That is not going to help. It is actually make the whole ramp up or warm up process probably 3x longer. So that's that's my feedback. Gotcha. Tom, I want to hear from you on this one. Yeah, I kind of agree with Kat. I think the the nuance is really when you've got a client on a dedicated IP and they're expanding, you know, you know, a new business unit comes on board and they mention they don't want to risk their current dedicated IP reputation. They want to use the share pool to mitigate risk. So that's you know, would be a big red flag for anyone right you don't and you know you don't want to put you know those customers who can't don't have the volume you know and are you know have a very good shared pool you don't want to put them at risk either so in using shared pools to warm up and protect your own dedicated ips is not the way forward that you know i'm sure alex might agree that that's the behavior of you know an illegitimate sender you know you do the the, the pre-work before migrating over well alex do you agree i i think the the idea or the presumption that this would work is kind of baffling to me. I don't really understand. I think to Kate's point, I don't understand the outcome. Like, what's your plan? <laughs> so um, I'm sure that somewhere somebody has said that this would work. But again, it just seems odd to me that. And, and furthermore, I, you know, there's, there's, again, a lot of data behind what mailbox providers do. 
And like, they're going to see a shared IP that's being warmed by all this other traffic. And then you're going to come on as the sole traffic person. And it's going to be very confusing to the mailbox provider, not confusing, but it's going to, it's going to have to retrain everything anyway. You're not, you're not doing much of anything beneficial. Uh, and again, we've talked about domain reputation several times already. Uh, so if you like, it, it's just, that feeds into this as well, but it just seems this whole thing kind of baffles me. So I'm going to call this a myth. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And because what do you think about this one? Mm, yeah, it's hundred percent myth. Um, um, I, and I agree with Kate, Tom, and what other panelists said. Uh, yeah, what the point of using shared IPs if you have a large, if you are a large sender? Anyway, you will be moving towards a dedicated one, then again, time for needed. So it is not advisable. Got it. Brad, close us out on that one. Yeah, for sure. I, I have to agree with everyone else with some really good points have been made here. The one sort of different, slightly different situation I would bring up is you sometimes see it when a customer is trying to migrate very quickly. Let's say they're moving from one platform to another. Um, they want to start sending very quickly. They are ramping up for you know specific, specific season or large sends or whatever. Um, in those cases, the motivation is a little different. So it's not necessarily, oh, I want to kind of pawn off my reputation on other folks so I can protect my own. Um, it's more that, hey, we've got a business goal that we're trying to meet. So uh, in that case, I just say, you know, whenever possible, plan ahead anytime that you're going to have to swap IPs if it's you know to a new provider or just spinning up a new uh, division of your organization um, make sure that you leave plenty of space in there for that IP warm-up and account for that as part of your migration plan got it got it all right I love this next question because we were Alex was actually just talking about it just a moment ago and I feel like this is the future but ladies and gentlemen most people are moving towards domain reputation eventually domain reputation will be far more important Alex, starting with you on this one. I don't think this is really that surprising. I mean, I think this is really beneficial for brands as well. I mean, the, you know, having domain reputation allows you to segment, you know, like notifications versus marketing. It allows the mail provider to treat those separately and sometimes, you know, roll that up to your higher level domain to say like, hey, yeah, like, you know, whatever your domain is, is good. But for some reason, marketing is bad, but transaction is super amazing. Like, it does help. And, and, you know, those, those reputations, um, th there's a phrase that, that is used out there that like, you know, reputation gives you the deliverability that you deserve. Um, and it's, it's, there's a, there's somebody that we work with that says that a lot. Um, and so the domain reputation helps you, allows you to be more flexible in certain ways. Like you can just grow into a new IP. Like the IP needs to have a little bit of reputation, but your domain is bringing all of its hopefully good reputation with it. Um, you know, so you, there's, it really should in the long run should be much more beneficial and easier to manage than IP reputation. So. Got it. Kate, how are you feeling on that one? I have to hun be hundred percent in agreement with Alex. He put it well, um, out there. Um, again, since we mentioned about IP reputation and domain reputation, IP reputation was a huge thing maybe 10 years ago, but since then, given there is no more space on the V4 network, a lot of major providers, they have moved towards domain reputation. And I can see us going like IP reputation becomes and becomes less important than the domain reputation gets more attention for the inbox placement. Uh, right now, all of the major providers are doing it. So if you are, if your traffic is Gmail, Outlook, Comcast, uh, Yahoo, AOL, then they all of those major providers are giving more rate to the domain reputation. So I would definitely focus on uh, maintaining a good, rep building up a good reputation on your domain and maintaining it in the long term for higher inbox rates. Really quickly, that Kate touched on something that is imp an important part of domain reputation, which is that as we have exhausted what the IPv4 addresses that are available, people, more and more folks are moving into an IPv6 world. Um, and so that allows, with domain reputation, it's it's a much easier migration, right? You can say we have v4 and we have v6. The IPs may have different reputation, but your domain will have the same reputation on both sets of IP uh, systems. So that is one hugely beneficial part of this as well. Got it. Brad, how are you feeling on that one? <laughs> 
I think Alex and Kate have said it probably as, as well as I possibly could. The one thing I would add, I always got a little something to add here. Um, don't use cousin domains. I don't know if you know, you Ooh. know, if you're, you know, messagegears.com, don't use like messagegearsmail.com, uh, you know, to try to send different print because so many of the providers see that as questionable. And, you know, even as a recipient of a mail, you know, you get something from your bank and it comes from, you know, mybankmail.com as opposed to the actual my bank domain. Is that real or is that fish? So, uh, you know, try and keep it on your main reputation domain. Use those subdomains as possible, but absolutely 100% truth on this one. Love it. Tom, how are you feeling on that one? Yeah, 100% truth. I don't think I can articulate any better. Um, I think just it's important about just um, separating you know, you know, traffic streams onto different subdomains. You know, I you know, still have customers that are trying to use just one for all. Um, so it's really about, okay, you know, the importance of that separation so they can really, you know, see like, as I put like, oh, there's a, you know, the marketing domain isn't performing as well as a transactional, for example. Got it. Pinkaj, closing remarks on that one? Uh, yeah, hundred percent agree with all. Um, uh, if you think as a brand brand perspective, not as primer, then domain is the identifier. Uh, that domain is the part that customer knows about it. I, IP is not well, IP does not work as an identifier. So, yeah, the brand should always focus or should give more weight to domain reputation along with the other statement that the panelists said so i 100 percent likely got it got it all right moving on here uh kate we're gonna go with you on this one less is more during the holiday season and yes all around everyone every time i my recommendation to marketers is like try to send less email but more focused more personalized email especially during holidays everybody all of these senders are trying to grab subscribers attention and our mailboxes are going to be massively crowded so please be mindful imagine there is this person sitting behind each of these email addresses and they have like i wouldn't um be very very aggressive during the holiday season people have less patience inboxes are super crowded so definitely less is more throughout the year in particular during the holiday season got it who else feels strongly about this one i think just less I think okay for less in general i think there's opportunity where you just want to send something for the sake of it i think we know back you know, when the pandemic was on people were just sending updates for the sake of it when oh, things man. you know when flights weren't going but people were still saying hey i gotta tell everyone about we can't still can't fly like well why do we need to um and also the holiday season's expanding right you know we've seen it grow from like a couple of weeks months it's almost like a non-stop thing so uh, you know we have fatigue by the end of the year january we're exhausted from how full our mailbox is Oh, yeah. I mean, inbox fatigue is a real thing. People don't, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with my inbox anymore. Oh, and the lights just went off in my room. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the inbox fatigue is, is a real thing. Um, you know, people don't, they, they start avoiding their inbox because they know that there's going to be, you know, far more messages than they really need to, d to deal with or that they want to deal with. Um, so to Kate's point, yes, I agree. Less is more. Try to make it more focused, more, more purpose driven, whatever it may be so that you, I mean, the goal there is engagement and you don't necessarily get engagement with a deluge. I mean, it's make it so that it's meaningful to them and that it's something that they want. All right. Last remarks on that one, anyone? All right. Moving on, moving on. Okay. And this one kind of coincides with the last one a little bit. Really quick, everyone. Everyone is more forgiving during the holiday season. Triple your volume. Ooh. All together. No. <laughs> no. Please don't. <laughs> there you heard it from the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Please don't. <laughs> we're we're going to leave that one as a yes. That's a big old myth. A big old X on that yes. one. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Okay. Oh, you shouldn't have too many subdomains. Oh, 
He was feeling strongly on that one. So I think, I think, you know, this, not that what Brad said earlier about the cousin domains really ties in here, but when you have so many subdomains that the traffic on some of those subdomains becomes unrecognizable to the reputation platform, then you're going to get the reputation that is ascribed to the, to the higher level domain. Um, so it's not that you can't have too many, but they should be with purpose, I guess is probably the right way to say that. You know, if it's if you send out three emails a year on a subdomain, that's probably not going to really do much for anybody. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you're sending out all of your emails, no matter what they are, on a single subdomain, then that's probably the wrong way to do that. Um, you know, there's I don't think there's there's no such thing as too many as long as they are all well defined and they have good use. So that's what I would say. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Good. Yeah, it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, there is no, n there is nothing negative about having too many subdomains. So there is no magic number of like you can have maximum ten or a hundred or a thousand. As long as since Alex Alex touched on this one, that if the volume on that subdomain is so low, you it can confuse the ISP um, filter. So if you have significant enough recognizable traffic absolutely go on different subdomains but if the traffic is too low it may hurt you and then the isps are gonna go fall back to their organizational domain and so forth so uh, there is no limit in the number of subdomains but at the same time be mindful of how many you want to create pinkaj you're gonna say go ahead yeah i agree i agree with kate that there is technically there is no limit uh, for the subdomain uh, it's a need and requirement. Uh, so, what, what do, you, uh, how many subdomains that you need? Even um, the subdomain should work um, uh, based on you know the kind of businesses that you are doing. So, if you are having uh, more than one vertical, then assign the subdomain accordingly. Otherwise, it is a no point of keeping uh, 10, 20 subdomains randomly. There is no use of it. Got it. All right, moving on here. Uh, okay, the best way to increase sales is to include marketing messages within the transactional emails and bypass the unsubscribe link. I'm going to go with Tom on this one. Tom, how are you feeling? Uh, please don't. I beg yeah. With you. Um, yeah um, I mean, you know, I think the, the big part right there is, you know, there's different legislations in different countries which very clearly call out a no-no on that. Um, you know, I'm sure all of us have seen customers do that in the past. Um, so it's, it's around the education of making sure, like, you know, identifying what is truly marketing. I think some customers in the past aren't sure what they think marketing is and they believe they could put it in a transactional message as well. So that I think part of it's education as well to make sure the difference on what each one is. 100%, 100%. Um, cool, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go and keep moving on because we only have so much time. But this one, I think, is a very... We're seeing this as a current topic. You shouldn't send terms of service updates to sunset contacts. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's go with Brad on that one. Brad, how are you feeling? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm feeling pretty strongly about this. <laughs> so, um, you know, usually when we get this this question, this kind of request, it's around, you know, we have to send this update. Our legal team says we have to send it to everybody. Um, you know, I know for marketers, the actual people sending the email, a lot of times you may not have much pushback on that. But if you do, if you have input on that, um, you know, we're not lawyers. The disclaimer is here. However, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to send an email terms of service update to everyone. You can do app interrupts. You can do, uh, you know, different types of, of contact to people, depending on, you know, your audience and how you typically interact with them. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be an email sent to folks who haven't engaged in anything in five years or 10 years. Um, if you do end up in that situation where, you know, your legal team says you have to do it, you have to send an email to folks who have been inactive for a very long time, you do have the opportunity to potentially reach out to the, the mailbox provider. So, uh, you know, Alex, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, you know, reach out to Alex or reach out to whomever, you know, at the, at the uh, uh, ISP or the mailbox provider and let them know, hey, this is something that we have to do. Um, you know, be aware that this is something that's going to happen and, and they may potentially be able to work with you again, depending on, you know, how the performance looks or their algorithms, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, just as a general rule, try to avoid it if it's at all possible. 
One thing I want to add to what Brad and Alex mentioned is if for your term of service or updates, uh, use a different IP, set of IPs and subdomain. So because if the some usually people do not read those, the read time is like almost zero. People delete or report them as spam. So you don't want all of those to impact your really good marketing or transactional traffic. So my recommendation is use a different IP and subdomain for term of service updates. And since it's required by attorneys to do it, so you have to send it, but you don't have to send it from your main domain. Got it, got it. All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, DMARC setup is optional. Ooh, okay. I'm going to go with with on this one. Pinkaj, how do you feel on this one? Yeah, um, it is optional technically, um, but uh, functionally, this should be set up. Uh, I have seen some cases uh, where uh, the brand's subdomain have been spoofed because of there was no policy set up for DMARC. So in order to protect your identity and in order to protect your users also, it is always advisable and uh, that we should have um, DMARC policy uh, put in live for your all sending domain and traffic. Got it. Tom, how do you feel on that one as well? Yeah, I agree. I think sometimes, you know, in an ideal world, you know, we would want everyone to do it, but I think it's, it's going to depend, right? I think sometimes there's definitely sends out there who don't have the technical resource to be able to change it themselves. And sometimes there's a bit of red tape in the way to be able to, you know, they have to get that request in. So I think that's where for me, it's nuanced. Got it. Got it. All right. This upcoming one, I want to hear from everybody on this one. Okay. Changing ESPs will solve your email deliverability problems. Myth or truth? Myth. 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 Unless Anyone? you switch to RESP. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, any quick remarks on that one? We've got time for one person on that one. For me, I would just say if you like, if you're sort of forcing bad practices upon your ESP, and your ESP disagrees with those practices you're trying to use, then it doesn't matter if you change. You're still taking bad practices with you. So. And you heard it from the source, folks, right there. Don't take those bad practices. All right, we got we got two more left for our wonderful panelists here. Uh, having zero percent unsubscribe and or spam rates is a good thing. Ooh, who feels who feels uh, bothered by this one? How are we feeling? I'll go with the myth for this one because it's almost in, it's too good to be true. It's impossible to send a campaign that. 100% of people enjoy receiving them and do not want to unsubscribe or report a spam. So if if that is zero, if your spam rate is zero, maybe your FBLs are broken. So then now you need you have bigger problems to solve. But um, I would see this is as a red flag if it is zero. Got it. Any quick remarks left on that one? Anyone? Yeah, I agree, I agree with Kate. Yeah, um, if you are sending um, millions of emails, uh, um, the the idea is that uh, why people spam actually. So if 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 your email is uh, receiving in this inbox, then only people can spam. Otherwise, that is an indicator of that you are not doing good in terms of marketing. So that's it. Got it. Got it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got one more. Using no reply in the sender email address is okay. Oh, all together. Me. 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 Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I know it's meant to be sort of, but I'm, I'm really like, you know, we're meant to be building relationships with our customers. So yes. if you don't have a response, it could be updates at, rather than no reply. That's telling you that you don't value their opinion or their response to you. Hundred percent. It's like uh, it's like sending a letter to someone without a, a way to respond back, right? We want to yeah. keep be, we want to keep being able to communicate with our customers. If I receive an email like that with no reply, who am I going to reach out to with my issue? Shoot, won't ever get resolved, I guess. Last, any last comments on that one, ladies and gentlemen? None. Cool, love it. Seen a big no from Alex. <laughs> awesome, no, I said awesome. no more comments. I didn't. No more. <laughs> This is this is again. I think this is this is a little bit nuanced. Um, just that 
it kind of depends on the purpose of the message. If it's like an, if it's a notice about like my flight being canceled, replying via email is not going to do any good. Right. So there is a little bit of a nuance there, but generally speaking, like from a, if it's promotional and marketing, you probably shouldn't. So there you have it folks. Awesome. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank our presenters for being here. Brad, Tom, Kate, Alex, and Pankaj. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us at Email Camp Mission Control. I hope you had a lot of fun. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to contact any of these email experts, this is how you can get a hold of them. Uh, they are more than happy to talk to you. I, I had such a good time today having them on here on Email Camp Mission Control. So I want to thank them for being here. And most importantly, just enjoying it and having a good time. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go ahead and wave goodbye. Hopefully we'll see you out in space somewhere. <laughs> Thank you to Tom, Brad, Kate, and Pankaj, and Alex for being here for Email Camp Mission Control, and we'll see you down the line. This is Thomas T. Canary and signing out. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thank you.